Hey guys, welcome to week 10, Cognition and Language. Um, this is quite a doozy of a week, and I'm not feeling well, so if you hear me blowing my nose, coughing, choking, dying, I'm really sorry I'm not feeling well. But let's get started so we can end this quickly. <laughs> Alright, so here's a list of words. I want you to think very carefully of what's the best way to remember these words. I'll give you 15 seconds to look over them. Come up with a good strategy by not writing them down. Let's also think of that. Okay. One way you can remember them is hopefully some of you probably were doing this is using peg words or uh, remembering things in a certain order. You need to associate them with a certain number. So the first one on the list is one is bun, two is shoe, three is tree, and so on. The words used in the last are rhyming words with numbers, so that's easy, okay? So peg words are a major aspect in order to help remember words, or in special order. So what are some other words? Okay, what if I had to memorize dog, shoe, and clock in that order? I might associate the words with, uh, with my other words in, or in order. Dog, bun, hot dog, bun. Shoe, book, a book about shoes, clock, tree, wooden clock is made out of trees. Okay, coming up with stories help us remember things. Now, why is this important? We're not talking about memory. We're talking about cognition. Well, p cognition is all about thinking and how the thinking process works. So when we're dealing with cognition, it's how we think things through. So all of these little strategies that we're using, peg words, uh, tying words to stories, all of that is very, very important because it allows us to think a little bit more effectively. Um, language, natural language mediators are different ways we uh, remember things and a lot of advertisements actually use this all the time so we can actually remember what they're selling. Many slogans and rhythmic jingles can make it easier to remember slogans and store brands. Okay, If you've ever talked to a little kid and you mention a specific toy, a specific restaurant, they'll sing you the little song like, I'm loving it. McDonald's, okay? I wish I was an Oscar Mayer wiener. Everyone can pretty much sing that song. Um, okay, so when we're thinking of different things, it's easier to remember when we put it to a beat. I before E except after C. 30 days has September. Roy G. Biv, okay? All these words are associated with new information in order to be remembered, okay? Natural language mediators is about tying information to specific beats, to specific patterns. So why is this all important? Now we're tying language and thinking together and that's why it's important. Uh, Methods of Loki is a person, a very famous poet, who uh, wanted to really bring in how to remember information. And the experience of him going through all this information he believed people could improve memory by associating mental images in order for locating specific items. So when you think of the movie 21, for instance, okay, when he's memorizing all the call names, you know, when they say sweet, it really means plus 15. When they say, uh, when they scratch their eye, you know, it's, you know, negative seven or whatever. What he does, the the main characters, he's tying all that information to the visual acts of it in order to help tie that information together. So when we're dealing with words that have a certain order or dealing with trying to memorize, what you need to do or what you should do is put a visual picture to it. In case you haven't noticed, it's why we do our index cards with pictures on them. I know you love them. Alright, so what are the major cognitive thinking. What is cognitive thinking? Thinking is a cognitive process in which the brain uses information from the senses, emotion, and memory to create and manipulate mental representations such as concepts, images, schemas, and scripts. So this week we're not just talking about thinking and how thinking move works. And what we're doing is trying to improve the way you think, trying to talk about the different ways in which we think, and the different contexts in which we think. Okay? How do we solve problems? Now, one of the major ways we solve problems is breaking things down into concepts. A concept is a mental representation of categories of items or ideas based on experience. So your whole life, you have broken it down into major concepts. 
<coughs> I'm really sorry. Um, natural concepts represent objects and events. Okay, artificial concepts are defined by rules. We organize much of our declarative men men memories into concept hierarchies. Like for instance, when we're talking about our friends, automatically you have a concept of you know a list, a short list of really close friends. When we're dealing with athletes, you're dealing with a small list of you know athletes you can think of right off the top of your head. When we talk about declared memories, we're talking about actual things we have learned. Now here's a concept chart. Animals, has skin, eats, breathes. Okay, birds are two types of animals. Birds have wings, can fly, has feathers. Fish are another type of animal, has fins, can swim, has gills. Now there's different types of birds. Canar uh, canary and ostrich, there's two different types of fish, shark, salmon, okay? We take this major topic of concept, animal, and we break it down into smaller topics, okay? Concepts. Thought and the brain. Event related, uh, rel related potentials. Brain waves show the EEG in response to stimulation. That's what thinking is. Okay, schemas and scripts help you know. Schema is a knowledge cluster, a general framework that provides expectations about topics, events, objects, people, and situations in one's life. Okay, so for instance, if I asked you what is a picnic like, you're going to think back to your experience of a picnic or what you think a picnic should look like, and you're going to say you need a basket, you need to have drinks, you need to have food, you need to have a blue and white or a red and white uh, blanket to sit on, you need to be in a park. That is your knowledge cluster of a picnic. That's a schema. Okay? A script is a cluster of knowledge about sequences of events and actions expected during a, to occur in particular settings. So your schema is your general framework about picnics. The script is how that conversation is going to work. Um, how things happen first. Well, first you got to pick out a nice shady place in the park. Then you need to lay down the blanket. Then you need to put your basket on top. Then you need to sit down. Then you need to take out the food. Then you need to start eating, having a conversation. After you eat, you put the food away and you lie on the blanket. That would be the script. Schema is what you think it actually looks like. Script is how it actually progresses. What abilities do good? <laughs> good thinkers not only have a repertoire of effective algorithms and heuristics, they know how to avoid the common impediments to problem solving and decision making. So what that means is, not only people who are good thinkers can think through a problem, is that good problem solvers. They are very effective if they come against a roadblock figuring out a way around it. So, what are some major problem-solving skills people have? Okay, what they're good at is identifying the problem and selecting the right strategy. Now, some of us are good at one of these things, some of us are good at the other thing. Very good problem-solvers are good at both. Now, what type of strategies do problem-solvers use? Algorithms is one of the most effective ones. Problem-solving procedures or formulas that guarantee a correct outcome if correctly applied. Math for instance, is a perfect example of algorithms. Um, we use them every day in our social lives as well. If you've ever watched The Social Network, okay, with Facebook creation, they talk about algorithms of how likely you are to do something looking at this. All of those help you become more successful. Heuristics are cognitive strategies used as shortcuts to solve complex mental tasks. They do not guarantee a correct solution. Okay, so heuristics are cognitive strategies used as shortcuts. Okay, so um, for, in, for instance, when you take a big problem and you simplify them in order to get a better understanding, it doesn't mean you'll always get the answer right, but it does mean you're going to have a little bit more success. Okay, so a useful uh, heuristics include working backwards, searching for analogies, breaking a big problem into smaller problems. So, for instance, looking at this heuristic, we see a mouse, we see cheese, okay? How would you work backwards? Well, why don't we start at the end, looking at where the cheese is, and follow 
the cheese in in order to get to the rat. Can you do it? Okay, let's see if you can. See if you can beat me. Got it. Okay, working backwards is more successful. That's a heuristic. Other obstacles in problem solving is a mental set. A tendency to respond to a new problem in a manner used for previous problems. These are things that stand in your way. Okay? A mental set. If I solved the last two problems by adding, you know, two puppies to the situation, the next three problems I'm going to say, well, why can't I just add two puppies? Okay? Kind of ridiculous example, but mental set is even though we're dealing with new information, we can't change the way we're looking at it. Functional fixedness, inability to perceive new information uh, for an object associated with a different purpose. For instance, if you were in a room and you needed to break the window and you didn't have a rock or anything, but you did have a book, some people would say, well, the, well, the book wouldn't break the window. Well, yeah, actually it would. So seeing the book is only a literary entertainment, not quite a book, would be an issue. Okay? Now, look at these words and try to unscramble them. I'll give you a couple seconds. All right, can you guess? Have you used an algorithm to figure it out? As soon as I tell you what it is, you're going to figure it out very quickly. Okay? The unscramble words are linen, scene, lens. Okay? Now, if you look at the other words, if you look back at the unscrambled words, the last three letters, let's look at linen, E-N-E-L-I-N, -E if you put the last three in front, and then put EN, switch the order of that at the end, that gives you linen. Doesn't always work for the second column though. That's a whole different order. Okay, so the algorithm in one is the last three letters are first, switch the order of the first two. Completes the word. Second order, not so much. Okay, however, if you figured out the first column, you probably was having an issue trying to figure out the second column. What is this about? Okay, um, that would be a mental set. If you couldn't figure out the second one but could figure out the first one, it's a mental set. You're trying to use the same algorithm from set one to try to answer set two. Okay, other obstacles include self-imposed limitations. For instance, I'm awful at math. So as soon as I see math equations, I'm automatically like, ugh, I can't do this, I can't do this. Okay, lack of interest. If you don't care about the problem, you're not going to solve it. I mean, that's just how it works. <laughs> okay, fatigue. The more tired you get, the lack of effort you put in, and drugs. <laughs> legal and illegal, okay? The more you take drugs, legal and illegal, the more likely you are to solve some problems here. Okay, so without lifting your pen from the page, can you connect all nine dots in only four lines? I'll give you a second. All right, here's a solution. Hopefully, most of you have probably seen this before. Okay? There you go. It's a little strange, okay? You had to think outside the box. No longer could you just have a mental set of using only in that limited space. That's why it's circled in blue. Most of you wouldn't think to think outside the lines. Okay? So judging and making decisions, there's major theories in place. Confirmation bias, hindsight, anchoring, representative, and avail availability. So let's talk about confirmation. Confirmation bias is ignoring or finding fault with information that does not fit our opinions. So for instance, if I was talking about how we could solve world peace, okay, you're only going to agree with the information I'm providing that you actually agree with. If I'm talking about all these different ways and you don't think that's accurate, then you're not going to agree. Hindsight bias, tendency after learning about an event, we believe the one could have predicted the event in advance later. Okay. Also known as uh, you know hindsight's 2020. Okay, that we should have saw things coming, 
okay? Like after you break up with your girlfriend, boyfriend, all of your friends, you always say, I should have seen it coming, I should have seen it coming. Okay, well, it's not always the case. Anchoring bias, a faulty heuristic caused by basing an estimate on completely unrelated quantity. So your heuristic about understanding a certain situation, if you started wrong, it's going to be wrong the whole time. So it's important to make sure your information you're basing everything on is correct. Representative bias is a faulty heuristic strategy based on presumption that once a person or event is categorized, it shares all features of the members in that category. Assuming that everything's identical to other heuristics is not a good thing. Okay, that's a representative bias. Availability bias is a faulty heuristic strategy that estimates probabilities based on information that we can recall from personal experience. Okay, I know we've all had very exciting lives. However, it doesn't mean we've experienced everything. Our lack of experience with everything that can occur in the world gives us... Um, it's not a solid base to solve problems based on our own understanding. Okay, so uh, availability or bias means that although we don't have it, have that direct experience, we're assuming we do. So how do children and infants develop language? Okay, infants and children face uh, are faced with trying to learn language. If you think about it, our lives are completely encircled by language. So if children don't pick it up quickly, they're at a huge disadvantage. So how do they do it? Well, first we have to understand a little bit more about language. There's 6,800 6, different languages in the world today. 250, 250 languages are spoken by more than 1 million people. Only 600 languages have enough population to support them to the turn of the century. 66% of the world's population are raised bilingual. Only 6.3% of United States citizens are bilingual. Okay? So, I'll let you read the bottom part. It's very, very interesting. Okay? So languages can go extinct. So how do children acquire language? Innateness theory of language is one way we deal with it. Children learn language mainly by following an inborn program for acquiring vocabulary and grammar. What that means is, is that we as humans are built to learn language, that it's born within us. I'm really sorry. Language acquisition device, LED is a structure in the brain innately programmed with some of the fundamental rules of grammar. So inside our brain, we have a language center that is programmed with some fundamental rules about grammar and understanding the meaning. Early stages of language acquisition include the following, the babbling stage, one word, two word, telegraphic speech, and the naming explosion stage. So what are these stages? At the cooing and babbling stage is about three months of age. The infant begins to coo, coo, they make little noises. At about five months of age, the infant begins to babble, which means they're talking nonsense. Okay? Na, na, mama, not mama specifically, but ga, ga, la, la. Okay? Infants all over the world use the same sounds, phonemes, when they babble. Okay? So it doesn't matter if you're in China, if you're in Germany, France, the United States, it doesn't matter. All babies around age five months make the same noises. At around nine months of age, babies begin to babble more in the sounds of their specific language. Okay? Uh, we'll begin to babble only the phonemes of the child's native tongue for about a year about a year of age. Okay? Babbling seems to be biologically programmed. Um, is a stage of language development. The one word stage is long before babies become accomplished talkers. They understand much of what is said to them. Okay, so we've gone through the cooing and the babbling stage, now we're in a one word stage. Okay, long before babies become accomplished talkers, they understand much of what is being said to them. If you've ever looked at baby Einstein when they make sign language, and they look at cards and they can tell you what they're doing. That's because they're literally, their brain has not developed enough for them to make words, but they understand words. 
Comprehension vocabulary, the words they understand is much louder than their production vocabulary, the words they can say. <laughs> Around the first birthday, infants produce their first real words, usually referring to concrete objects or people that are important to them. This is when you start having mama, dada. Um, ch the child uses one word to convey complete thoughts or ideas. Okay, very, very important. It's not like the child hasn't learned language. It's They've also learned a lot of language. They just can't pronounce it. Okay, two-word stage. Around their second birthday, infants begin putting sentences together to construct simple sentences. Two-word sentences showing an appreciation of the rules of grammar. Okay, children move beyond the two-word stage around two and a half years old. Language production and comprehension increases dramatically thereafter. Children have production vocabulary of over 10,000 words by school age. This is when you have, at the two-word stage, hungry. I'm hungry. No. Mom, please. Okay, very simple, simple words. Overgeneralization is what we see with a lot of kids. Um, child, children will overgeneralize grammar rules, so they apparent, apply the rules too broadly. You see this a lot with four and five year olds. Example, I dug in the sandbox. They understand that it was in past tense, so they do understand the present and past tense, but they don't understand that you can't just add ed to everything. <laughs> uh, rather than I dug in the sandbox, I have feet. Okay, they understand you put s because you have two, plural. They don't get that. Okay. Um, another example of overgeneralization is yesterday I helped mommy broom the floor and then we go to the toy store. Okay, goad, went, okay, changes. Uh, the rules of grammar, we've been talking about the rules of grammar, but let's just make sure we're all on the same page. For all of those of you in AP Lang, this should be very familiar. Grammar is the rules of language. Okay, this is plural, past tense, all of those wonderful things we learned about. Morphemes are the smallest meaningful units of language that make up our words, like um, and overregularization is the applying of grammatical rules too widely and thereby create, creating incorrect forms using hidden and feats. Okay, over regularization, over generalization is another word we use for that. So how do we measure? individual differences. Uh, it's an essential component of psychology, but strict guidelines and ethical standards must be followed to ensure results and conclusions are valid and appropriate. So when we're looking at cognition, we're looking at how we can evaluate people. So then this is where we start testing. One of the major things we do in testing is validity and reliability. In all the major tests you've ever taken, SAT, uh, FCAT, all those major tests, these are both reliable and valid. What do these mean? Validity is a proper is a property exhibited by a test that measures what it purports to measure. What that means is validity means that the test is actually testing what it says it's going to test. If I was giving you a test on cognition and language and I asked you questions on memory and sensation and perception, that test would be invalid because I'm not actually testing you on what I'm saying I'm testing you on. Okay? How do we measure it? We face validity, looking at what it actually means and how it applies. Content validity means we look at every single question and we see if it's actually testing the appropriate information. And criterion validity is how are we actually grading those tests in order to see how well they're learning. Now, validity and reliability, when we're dealing with reliability, it's a property exhibited by the test that yields the same results over time. Validity makes sure we're testing what we say we're testing. Reliability means it's actually doing its job and that it's actually doing it correctly. So, f for example, an example of reliability is the test I'm giving you this week. If I gave it to you next week, you would still get a similar score. Okay? If you take the FCAT twice, you should be getting similar scores if you haven't done anything to change it, like if you haven't been taking retests and retest class and all that stuff. Test, retest, reliability is just what I was explaining. If I gave you a test today and saw how you did, if I give you the same exact test tomorrow, you should do the same. 
split half reliability is if the test is fair and valid okay what happens is is that if I give you one half of the test you should get a score if I gave you the second half of that same test you should have a pretty balanced score standardization and norms is something we deal with a lot especially in the age of testing as we are in currently right now scientists use statistics to establish a normal curve we've talked about this okay um, this curve can be used to describe most phenomena, okay, also known as a bell curve. Uh, the normal range sco uh, scores fall near the middle of normal distribution, okay? Here's our normal range. Many people are in the middle, and it starts getting fewer and fewer out by the side, okay? We've talked about this before, so I'm going to kind of flash right through this. There's different types of tests. There's an objective test that can be scored easily by a machine. Um, these are your multiple choice tests. In subjective tests, individuals are given an ambiguous figure in an open-ended situation and asked to describe what they see or finish a story. Objective tests are your FCAT, your SAT. There is an answer. Your subjective tests are how do you interpret certain things. Uh, for instance, on the military exams, there's a subjective part of it where you have to solve a problem. Okay, ink blots is also known as a subjective test. Uh, what they are is you're presented a ink blot, which is this. There's no real uh, explanation of what it is, but I would be asked, well, what do you see? Well, I see a very angry armadillo. That's my interpretation of it. There's no wrong answer, but your answer you're giving in this subjective test relates about your understanding, your ideas, your thoughts. Um, some other ways we look at tests are inter-rater reliability measures how similar two different test scores would score a test. Scoring, a person who's scoring the test is almost as important as the person taking the test. Um, if the person who is scoring the test does not do their job appropriately, then the score, the test taker is going to lose points. So we have to make sure that the tester, the graders are on the same page. AP does a really great job making sure this. Um, with this idea of how we measure, the inkblot tests are becoming less and less popular, okay, because they're so wide open. Ethics and standards of testing. Ethical concerns related to testing involve the confidentiality of test results, okay. No one should know your FCAT scores. No one should know your SAT scores. No one should know all of these things because it's information about you. So the school has to keep those uh, private, confidential. Um, learning how to report results is also a big deal. Okay, we're not quite sure how to do it. How to use the test to compare individuals. Now, every individual is different. Um, how they see the world, how they answer questions, all of these things are different. So, is it fair that we take a test at one moment in time and rate you on it and compare you to your peers, just like the FCAT, the SAT, and all that? Just that's part of the major ethics in testing. Okay, the impact on tests as a society as a whole. Like, what is the lasting impact? Um, there's a lot of criticism right now on the impacts of tests and how they're impacting whether you graduate high school or not. Should that be the only factor in you graduating high school is if you can pass the FCAT? Some people say yes to make sure you've learned the basic skills. Some people say no, I've been able to do this, this, and this, and this, and, and I did poorly on one day of my high school career and I can't graduate. These are the major concerns. Okay? So, I'll give you a second to test uh, how much you've learned so far. When we check to see whether a test will yield the same results over time, we are assessing that it is A, reliability, validity, normality, objectivity, subjectivity. What is the answer? The answer is reliability. Two, all the following are components of ethical testing except item analysis, validity, reliability, objectivity, instinct. The Answer is E. So how intelligence testing is done is a lot of controversy. Most psychologists now view intelligence as a normally distributed trait that can be measured by performance on a variety of tasks. Okay? 
One of the most common ways we test intelligence is the Binet-Simon test, which is calculates the child's mental age and compared to his or her chronological age. In America, testing became very wide, widespread assessment of army recruits, immigrants, and school children. Okay, so uh, the Binet-Simon test tries to figure out the mental age versus the chronological age. The Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale is the most respected of all of them. Um, there's probably a bunch of you who are listening to this who have actually taken this, whether you knew it or not. I have taken it when I was like fifth or sixth grade. The intelligence quotient, also known as IQ, is a numerical score on the intelligence test originally computed by dividing a person's mental age by chronological age and multiplying by 100. Okay, the original IQ calculation was abandoned in favor of standardized scores based on normal distribution. So no longer do we really care about your IQ score, we care about how you do on a certain level of tests. So sample IQ test questions, uh, select the best definition for each word, uh, viable, okay, looking at it, imminent, looking at these, just selecting the best definition, test your understanding. Analogies are also a very popular way to test intelligence, making sure you can analyze the relationship between two words and find the answer. So Washington Lincoln, July, Ocean Canoe, verse, yeah. okay, just simple examples. Mathematical reasoning, here are some other examples. Uh, Okay, so exceptional child. Mental retardation is also conceived as representing the lower 2% of the IQ range. Okay? Giftne giftedness often conceived as representing the upper 2% of the IQ range. So the lower is mental, the higher is gifted. Uh, Terman studies, he selected 1,528 children who scored at the top of the IQ range in 1921. What he ended up doing is following these kids for the rest of their lives and figured out what they actually accomplished. It's called the longitudinal study when you study people over very long periods and he retested their intelligence throughout the years. Most of them excelled in school. They published lots of articles, wrote a lot of books, but despite many of the achievements they became, None of them became a Picasso or an Einstein. Many of them led very normal and uneventful lives. So just because you're gifted doesn't mean you're going to have a life of, of stellar qualities uh, like these major people like Einstein and Picasso. One of, uh, let's, here's another question for you. Read carefully and quietly to yourself. The answer is A, the average age at which people achieve a particular score on the intelligence test. Okay, you have attested a 12-year-old child and found that she has a mental age of 15. Using the IQ formula, what is her IQ? The answer is D. The problem with the original IQ formula is it gave distorted picture of the intellectual abilities of D, gifted students. If intelligence is normally distributed in characteristic, then you would expect to find it So what are the components? Some psychologists, psychologists believe that the essence of intelligence is a signal general factor, while others believe intelligence is based on collection of distinct abilities. Now, savant syndrome is one of the components found in individuals who have remarkable talent, even though they're mentally slow in other domains. Um, we have, there are many examples of this, uh, very famous examples, Rain Man,
okay? Where Tom Cruise's brother can count cards like crazy, but, you know, is uh, mentally challenged in many other factors of his life. Okay, the psychometric theories of intelligence believe that people who, who perform well in one cognitive test tend to be tend to perform well in other tests. I think most of you would agree with this. If you perform well on the SAT, you're probably going to do well on the GRE. And if you do well on the GRE, then you're probably going to do well on the bar exam. If you did well on the bar exam, if you were trained appropriately, you would probably do well on the on other very difficult tests as well. While those who scored badly on one test tend to score badly on another, he concluded that intelligence is a general cognitive ability that can be measured and numerically expressed. This is called the G factor, a general ability proposed by Spearman as the main factor underlying all intelligent mental activity, that all of us have a specific G factor. We all have a certain intelligence number. Okay, G is for general intellect, something that's innate. Okay, so we're born with this G factor in that, you know, we can improve it a little bit, but not much. Psychometric theories of intelligence, mental measurements, uh, Raymond Cattall in 1963 came up with two components. Crystallized intelligence, the knowledge a person has acquired, plus the ability to access knowledge, and fluid intelligence, the ability to see complex relationships and solve problems. Your crystallized intelligence is your name, your address, your telephone number. Your fluid intelligence is if I gave you a list of five things and asked you to memorize it and go to the store and pick those up and you remembered, that's fluid intelligence. Steinberg's trichiatic theory is practical intelligence, analytical and creative intelligence. His practical intelligence is the ability to cope with the environment, is the street smarts aspect. Analytical is to be able to analyze problems, correct answers, ability measured by most IQ tests, also known as logical reasoning. And creative, a form of intelligence that helps people see new relationships among concepts, involves insight and creativity. Steinberg believes that every one of us fall into a specific category, that some of us are practical intelligence smart, some of us are analytically smart, some of us are creatively smart. I think this theory has a lot of weight to it. Gardner's multiple intelligence is one of the most popular theories. There's eight major components, linguistic, m logical, spatial, musical, body kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal. Linguistic, reading comprehension, vocab, logical, IQ test analogies, math problems, ability to form mental images of objects and think about their relationships in space, music, perceive and create patterns, Bodily, kinesthetic, controlled music and coordination, also known as dancing. Interpersonal, ability to understand other people's emotions. Ability to know oneself is inter, intra. Intra is know yourself. Inter is understand others. There's also an argument to add three more intelligences. The naturalistic, spiritual, and existential. Okay. That some people who are naturalistic discern patterns in nature, Darwin, he would be in naturalistic intelligence, spiritual, cognition of spiritual matters, existential is matters of the meaning of life. Cultural definitions, cross-culturally, psychologists have shown that intelligence has different meanings in different cultures, okay, that being smart in one culture isn't always the same, but both have very strong problem-solving abilities. While most psychologists believe that both heredity and environmental affect intelligence, they disagree on the source of IQ differences among racial and social groups. So how do uh, psychologists explain IQ? Hereditarian arguments or believe in the nature aspect maintain that intelligence is substantially influenced by genetics, nature. The nurture aspect is environmental approaches argue that intelligence can be dramatically shaped by influences health, economics, and education. That the better health you have, the smarter you can be. The more money you have, the smarter you're going to be. The better your education is, the smarter you'll be. Heritability and group differences. When we deal with heritability, it's the amount of trait variation within a group raised on the same conditions. Okay, so when we talk about group differences and heritability, we're dealing with twin studies. Yes. 
Heritability says nothing about between group difference. So when we're dealing with this, we're dealing with twins. We're not looking at, you know, one person from this house, one person from that house. Okay? I'm really sorry. I really flew that through that really quick. I'm not feeling well. But I hope you have a great week. And it's going to be awesome. So good luck.